positive Thompson test is shown for the injured limb with a negative result for the unaffected side. With the patient in semi-prone positioning, the Achilles tendon is mapped proximal and distal to the site of rupture. A 3 cm posterior medial incision is made with a scalpel approximately 5 cm proximal to the rupture site. Dissection is carried out to the level of the curl fascia, ensuring to protect the sural nerve if it is visualized. The curl fascia is then opened and the plane between the fascia and the peritinon is identified. The appearance of the curl fascia on the left and the peritinon on the right are shown. Further dissection is performed with METs to extend the opening of the plane, moving distally alongside the Achilles tendon on both the medial and lateral sides. The opening of the first curette is placed along the lateral border of the distal Achilles tendon, around 1 cm proximal to the tendon's insertion onto the calcaneus. The second curette is positioned in an identical manner, but along the medial tendon border. A straight needle is next introduced percutaneously in a trajectory passing within the curette openings and through the distal horizontal cross-section of the Achilles tendon. Upon verifying proper needle placement within the curette openings by pulling the curettes proximally, a second more proximal needle is inserted. The thread of suture number one is pulled through the path of the first needle and effective placement of the second needle is then also able to be confirmed. The thread of suture number two is crossed through the path of the second needle. The same process of needle passage, ascertainment of proper positioning, and crossing of the suture follows for two additional, more proximal threads of suture not incorporated in the traditional, minimally invasive Dresden repair. The threads of sutures number three and number four have the additional feature of one end being looped and the other end being non-looped. These ends are arranged such that the looped ends of the two threads are placed opposite, with one resting on the medial side and the other resting on the lateral side of the tendon. Once all suture threads have been passed through the horizontal span of the Achilles tendon, each curette instrument is removed one at a time, pulling the ends of the suture threads from that side through the incision. After organizing the threads externally to match their position in the tendon from distal to proximal, each suture is independently assessed by pulling on the suture ends to produce a plantar flexion response. Both suture positioning within the tendon and overall grasp of the tendon are able to be discerned at this stage, with prior steps repeated until satisfactory results are achieved. The distal locking suture is created in the next stage of the procedure as demonstrated in this diagram, which shows suture number two being passed twice around the bundle of sutures number three and number four on both sides. In carrying out the required steps to establish the locking suture, sutures number three and number four are grasped in one hand and suture number two in the other hand. Suture number two is passed under and around the bundle of sutures number three and number four two times and then through the suture loop on that side. The non-looped end of suture number 3 or number 4 is then pulled on each side until the suture is removed from the limb. In spanning the paths previously occupied by sutures number 3 and number 4, suture number 2 is now a locking suture. Pulling on both ends of suture number 1 demonstrates the sliding nature of this suture. By contrast, pulling on both ends of suture number 2 does not show such sliding and instead appears fixed due to the locking configuration. After removing any suture creep by pulling firmly on both ends of suture number 2, both remaining sutures can now be anchored within the Achilles tendon proximal to the rupture site. With the foot in maximal plantar flexion to facilitate the tensioning process, a free curved needle is used to complete passage of the medial and lateral ends of suture number one across the proximal tendon aponeurosis. The two ends are directed obliquely across the tendon and perpendicular to each other in a sling configuration before being tied together. A needle driver is used to hold the first tie under tension with several hand ties subsequently performed. One end of suture number two is loaded onto the free curve needle and passed through the aponeurosis using the Krakow technique. The knot tying process utilized with suture number one is then repeated with suture number two. One end of each suture is trimmed with scissors at the knot while the remaining end is used with the curve needle to bury each knot into the tendon. With reattachment of the tendon complete and the repair appropriately tensioned to match that of the uninjured side, the Thompson test on the affected limb is now negative. This diagram demonstrates the final configuration of the modified Dresden repair with the distal locking suture. After closing the fascia, subcutaneous, and cutaneous layers, steri strips as well as a non-adhesive dressing are placed over the incision and local anesthetic is introduced proximal to the operative site. The foot is then placed into a 6-inch padded splint.